we're fortunate today to have with us David Cavagnero. David is a first-rate photographer and gardener from the Decora area, where for eight years he has been the garden manager for the Seed Saver Exchange. Last year, Ann Hesse and I went to the winter gardening fair that the Lynn County Master Gardeners give up in Cedar Rapids. And David filled the auditorium up there, and we sat and enjoyed his program so much that we came back and said, you know, we really want to share this with the people in Iowa City. And so that's how we were fortunate enough to get David to come down here today. So on this gray day, we look forward to David's colorful slides, and I'd like to introduce to you David Cavagnero. Thank you all for coming out on this rainy day. And I can tell there are a lot of people here ready to plant flowers and see color. <laughs> it's, it's winter time after all. Um, believe it or not, I've lived in Iowa now 17 years. This is my first trip to Iowa City. And um, I spent the last two days with uh, young friends of mine. I have a daughter in college here and her friends and, and uh, spent the last two days walking, walking, walking miles all over the historic districts of, um, of, this, of this town, and what a magnificent place. Um, I did learn one thing, though, about those of you who live at least in, in the central part of, of, of old Iowa City. There are a lot of trees here, uh, beautiful trees, incredibly beautiful trees, historic trees. Um, but trees create a lot of shade, and I'm realizing that today I'm going to be talking quite a bit about growing food producing crops as part of, of a garden, as part of a flower garden as a matter of fact. But there's one caveat I have, to, uh, I have to say, and that is that it's very, very hard to find any edible plant that grows well in the shade. <laughs> um, let, me, let me just see a show of hands on one simple question. How many of you grow something in your gardens at home that you can eat? Whoa, whoa, all right, well. Shade or no shade, there you have it. So that's good. I was a little worried maybe that I was going to have to talk only about ferns and hostas today. <laughs> um, that's good. So maybe what I'm going to talk about will we'll, uh, we'll find a corner in everybody's garden. Um, I, I got involved in gardening actually through two avenues. The first avenue really was my love of nature. I've been sort of a naturalist all of my life. I was one of these kids that spent uh, his childhood swinging a butterfly net instead of a baseball bat, so I was always sort of a weirdo. And um, recently went back into some of the family uh, movies, these little uh, eight millimeter family movies, and I found that at six years old, I was doing exactly the same thing that I'm doing today, you know, pushing a wheelbarrow and hoeing with a hoe and haven't changed a whole lot <laughs> in all of these years. But um, so actually it was my love of nature that, that uh, drove me into, into the garden. Because actually when you stop and think about it, the garden is such a wonderful interface, isn't it, between us and the natural world. It's a place where, where uh, we as largely urban and suburban people now in, in America can actually touch the soil experience the seasons, relate to nature in, in some meaningful way. We don't have a lot of time to be running around in the wilderness, and so the garden is really our main access to the natural world in a lot of respects. The other avenue for me was through the stomach, because uh, I come from an Italian family where all the men in the family cooked, and uh, uh, you know, I had this sort of 300-pound Italian grandmother that was all, you know, that made the ravioli and all the wonderful stuff, and she was always going to go on a diet tomorrow, you know. But uh, fantastic food in our family. So I grew up with a great interest in food. And so we always had vegetable gardens. My maternal grandparents uh, up in Sonoma County in California in the wine country had a, a, a big orchard and grapes in the backyard. and. Uh, you know, canning fruit together as a family was something we always did uh, with great, with great uh, relish. Oh, that's a bad pun. Um, so I come at gardening through these two, these two areas. And, and today what I want to talk about in particular is, um, is the idea that we have become so disconnected, not only from nature, but particularly we have become disconnected from our sustenance. 
I was really struck walking around town today, and, and mind you, it's winter, so I don't see much in the way of gardens, but I can tell where vegetable gardens would be, and there aren't a lot of them, in, uh, in, at least in the part of Iowa City that I, that I saw. A uh, lot of lawns, you know, a lot of lawnmowers. Um, and we were commenting as we walked around town that if this were Southeast Asia, or if this were Italy or France, every square inch of ground that's capable of enough sun to grow vegetables would have, would have fruits and vegetables growing. Um, we don't do that in America anymore. We go to the supermarket and we buy stuff from the Imperial Valley or the Sacramento Valley of California year-round, uh, off-season that's coming to us from South America at great environmental cost. And I, I think the worst cost is that we are now so separate from our own sustenance. Um, to me, that first vine-ripened tomato is, is, is something to live for. You know, I, I can't imagine going through life without the taste of the first tomato sun-ripened or, or a strawberry. This, these things you buy in the store today that are as big as watermelons, you know, I mean, what are those things? They're certainly not strawberries. I mean, so we, we have whole generations of people who are growing up thinking that this is the way food is. And um, boy, that wasn't the way grandma's food tasted, you can be sure. So I was very fascinated to come to Iowa and, be, and participate in the Seed Savers Exchange, which is a nonprofit organization devoted to uh, Backyard gardeners just like yourselves all over the United States who um, have been maintaining or are interested in maintaining heirloom varieties that were historic in, in this country or came over with our immigrant ancestors from other parts of the world. Um, as long ago as the pilgrims and as recently as the boat people from, from uh, Southeast Asia. So, um, and in the course of that eight years of managing the collection there, I grew believe it or not, 15,000 different varieties of, uh, of heirloom vegetables. 3,000 kinds of tomatoes, for instance. And please don't anyone ask me today what my favorite tomato is. No way. I mean, um, I just can't tell you because there's so many good ones. Uh, 300 kinds of garlic. I like garlic. Um, so. That was, that was a bit of background for me which really deepened and enriched my sense of the, of the food heritage from which we all come. I mean, there are a lot of uh, racial backgrounds, nationalities represented in this very room. We all came here from someone else, from somewhere else, and, um, uh, and often brought with us uh, our favorite varieties from Germany, from Sweden, from Norway, from Italy, from Spain, and so forth. Uh, so that's the kind of heritage that, uh, that we have built our, our uh, potpourri, sort of melting pot culture upon. The efforts of backyard farmers and gardeners uh, all over the world for thousands, maybe tens of thousands of years, we owe uh, our vegetable and fruit heritage. So what I'm going to do today is take you on a little tour through the kind of gardening that I enjoy doing. I'm calling it sort of edible landscaping. Um, Roz Creasy, whose books are in the back there, is, I consider, uh, the um, matriarch of, of edible landscaping, one of the pioneer authors and photographers in this field. Kathy Barish, whose books are also back there, uh, who now uh, lives in Des Moines, um, uh, is a pioneer in the, in, in the edible flower field, which we're going to get to a little bit later in the program. Um, and those, those books are well worth, well worth studying. Um, the, is the title of this talk Fork to Fork? Does that ring a bell? I, I stole that title, I admit, because I was invited to uh, uh, Australia in the spring, which is their autumn, to give uh, uh, a series of fall harvest dinner presentations for some friends of mine who have a, an heirloom seed company south of Melbourne. And um, um, Clive, who runs the company, uh, entitled those talks fork to fork, meaning garden fork to table fork, which I thought was a very clever uh, idea. And that's really what we're talking about here today, the idea of going out and spading up the ground and uh, bringing in the harvest and, uh, 
uh, and finally ending up with a table fork in our hands instead. So that sequence of events. And what I really want to impart today, I'm not going to be talking about vegetable gardening per se. What I want to share with you is the idea that growing food is, can be beautiful and there are ways of incorporating food producing plants into a flower garden, uh, into your, your decorative horticulture in ways which are uh, artistic and fun and still give you something uh, to eat as well. And then we're going to end up with edible flowers, which, uh, I mean, as long as you're growing flowers, you might as well eat them, you know? <laughs> so um, a, a caution about edible flowers, though, um, just while I'm thinking of it. Um, if you are interested in, in moving into that wonderful area of, of edible flowers, be sure to, to study the plant list carefully in those, in Kathy's books, for instance, because not all flowers are edible and some are actually poisonous. I remember one time I watched uh, in horror as a, a young person who thought she knew what she was doing was collecting leaves from her backyard to make comfrey tea, except she was picking them off a of foxglove. <laughs> and if you know what foxglove is, digitalis, you know, is a very nice, oh, that's my, <laughs> foul up the uh, technology here. Um, you don't want to be picking foxglove and making tea out of it, so you really do need to know what you're doing when you get into eating plants that are not the usual vegetables you're, you're familiar with. But there's some fantastically beautiful and flavorful flowers that you can incorporate into your cuisine. Okay, let us begin then. And um, wait a minute. There we go. And then I have to figure out how to do this. I got it? Okay, I need help already. I'm <laughs> uh, to figure out how to. Here she comes. Oh, you I, got I a trick of your slide. Oh, got to do that. No? Uh, what did we do? No, it's the light. Technical difficulties, please stand by. Um, <laughs> what did you? I probably did something. Keep talking. <laughs> well, <laughs> tell another story. There, there we go. Okay, now, but now we got to back up. There. Okay. Oh, I'm so glad she's there. I didn't, oh, she's out of the room now, I can safely say, I didn't want to warn her ahead of time, but I have this incredible thing about technology. I walk in the room and it all fails, you know. <laughs> I just gave a talk in Arizona. I shouldn't say this because I'll probably curse the, the system here. Three times during my lecture, for no reason that anybody could figure out, the screen just would go up, you know. <laughs> And then I would have to tell a long story while it very slowly went up and where it very slowly came down. Nobody, it never happened before, probably never happened since. So uh, I, I warn you ahead of time. Okay, so let's begin with, um, with kind of a conventional um, Iowa perennial border. One of the wonderful things I discovered in moving to Iowa was, was, the, was the wealth of perennials that people grow here. And so, you know, the mixed perennial border is, is something that, uh, that many of us grow and it's an effortless kind of, almost effortless kind of gardening as long as you don't have quack grass anywhere nearby and um, produces an array of color all season long. But there isn't a lot of edibility uh, in a perennial border. Um, in my gardens at home, I have about three acres of gardens and uh, I have perennial gardens. On the one hand, I have uh, annual gardens, I have mixed gardens, and then I have a production vegetable garden where I really, where everything is in rows and it's easy to, you know, rototill and easy to mulch and easy to maintain. Very regimented kind of vegetable gardening, which you see here. And because I grow virtually all my own food and have a big root cellar, um, I, I have a large garden uh, for food production. But this is not very imaginative and it's not very beautiful um, compared to the, uh, you know, to the mixed border. So we're really going to be moving more into the idea of mixing, mixing these things up a bit. But even a standard vegetable garden uh, like this little piece of mine 
can be made more interesting by getting away from the straight lines. Even just making curved lines, curved paths, begins to bring in a sense of artistry into a production vegetable garden. And sometimes, you know, the, the addition of, of interesting paths, stonework, brick pathways, whatever, you know, different uh, combinations of design can make a garden devoted entirely to food production more interesting. Some gardeners prefer raised beds uh, as a way of delineating paths and, and raising the soils up above uh, possibly waterlogged soil conditions and so forth. I don't do raised bed gardening of any kind unless the soil demands it. Um, and I'm, I don't do French intensive double digging in Iowa where I've got soils 20 feet deep. You know, it's like, why would you double dig soil that's already uh, beautiful ground 20 feet down, you know? Those kinds of, of efforts are, are important in areas where the environment demands it. But delineating beds with, uh, with, with wood or brick are ways of, you know, of uh, creating a production vegetable garden that, that can be at least more interesting. Um, but really what I'm going to be talking about today, as I said, is incorporating food production of various kinds into, um, into the flower garden itself. Now you have a handout that, uh, that you picked up at the front desk which lists a, a bunch of, of, of uh, vegetable crops that, um, um, that I tend to grow and some herbs which I tend to grow uh, because they're beautiful. Some of those you're going to see pictures of today. There's not an exact correlation between the list and the slides, so you'll, you'll maybe see varieties you might want to write down that aren't on the list. So keep your list handy and see if I'm talking about varieties that are on the list. Add ones that I may mention, uh, and there are some on the list that I won't necessarily have photos of. <coughs> of. Um, this is an overview of a piece of my uh, vegetable garden. And um, uh, actually a piece of my, my flower garden, I should say, with some food production mixed in. Um, this is just a small portion of the garden surrounding my house. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, you will see uh, trellises of grapes. And there's a, a plum tree right in almost the uh, upper s uh, center of the photograph. Um, so there's food production there. Way over on the extreme upper right is the beginning of, a per, of, a, of an annual border, which I'll show pictures of later, uh, mixed uh, decorative foliage plants, some edible, some not, strictly annuals. And in the foreground, you have a, a mixed perennial, perennial border. So I have food production mingled in with my flower garden in a variety of ways, even though I have a major production vegetable garden in a separate place. Okay, now oh, I'm sorry. here we go, pressing the wrong button. Um, another little section of my garden, looking back toward the house, is a mixture of herbs and edible flowers and non-edible flowers, kind of a random, almost like a wildflower garden mixed together. Some years I have beds like that. And I, I like to have the herb and salad garden right outside the kitchen because my vegetable garden actually is quite a ways away from the house. So I like to be able to just walk out the door and pick my fresh basil in the summer um, and other herbs and edible flowers right close by. Now these are just details of um, you know, flowers mixed in with, with vegetables. You'll see uh, lettuces there. You'll see purple basil. Uh, a favorite decorative vegetable I love to grow on the right is lacinato kale, sometimes called dinosaur kale. Uh, I'm going to be talking more about kales a little bit later. Another mixed area of vegetables includes, in this case, uh, beets. Uh, down in the, f in the lower part of the photo are a couple of heads of Italian radicchio, which is an edible endive, um, one that I grow for winter storage. There's some peppers mixed in, eggplants. Just to show you that even just a patch of vegetables mingled in together instead of in rows can give you a variety of color and form, um, which I think 
uh, as it is as appealing as a flower garden itself. Here again, this is pretty much all vegetables, squash, lacinato kale again, but I just love the, the combination of color and texture that one gets uh, as you begin to incorporate vegetables into the garden in a more random way. Leeks, parsley, leeks, parsley uh, basil, again kale, are a few of the, uh, the edible plants in that photo. Pumpkins, of course, mingling in. Um, another example, sunflowers, and in the foreground you'll see a little patch of, um, of beets with the foliage, the purple foliage, adding, adding um, a little color. And then right in the foreground, some chives, which gives another texture to the flower garden. Similarly here, more um, the very dark purple leaves of, that's probably um, um, a, a wonderful foliage beet called bull's blood, which uh, also has a very good edible beet, beet root to it, and parsley uh, in the foreground, and some leeks over there to the side. One year I planted a, a very interesting mixture of edible and not edible annuals in my annual uh, flower garden. And here you see, um, you see different kinds of kales. You see the nasturtiums, of course, which are edible flowers. And then coleus, which are not at all edible, but which add a, a great deal of foliage color in a garden like this. And I'm just very fond of these kinds of patterns in the garden, the, the, um, the combination of color and texture which the, the vegetables bring to bear in a flower garden I find very attractive. Right in the middle of that photograph you'll see a big borage plant which is one of my favorite edible flowers. And you'll see uh, collards in the lower portion of the picture and um, uh, young cabbages coming along in there. So, and some kales mixed in as well. Another year I planted a, a, an annual border in my garden that looked like this. It was a mixture of, um, of um, um, Swiss chard and marigolds, and I'll show you uh, some details that give you an idea of some of the other plants. Some of my favorite plants um, are in this photograph, the fuzzy leaf tomatoes. You may not realize that there are tomato varieties that have silvery fuzzy leaves that are very beautiful foliage plants. They have perfectly nice tomatoes as well. And then in the back there is tricolor corn, which gives a good dry corn if you're interested in grinding your own corn for uh, cornmeal. But when it's young, it, uh, the foliage is pink, white, and green all together. Very, very lovely plant. There's a close-up of one of those fuzzy tomatoes. Um, speaking of Australia, my friends in Australia, um, in their nursery garden, have a, a formal vegetable garden a, a, it's called a parterre, a garden that's divided into uh, geometric shapes. And every time I've gone there, they've had a different arrangement of flowers and vegetables growing together in this, um, in this parterre. In this particular year, they had Swiss chard and various uh, brassicas. They had the uh, lemon-scented marigolds, the little uh, yellow bushes of tiny marigold flowers, various basils, and a lot of other. And this is their kitchen garden, essentially. This is the garden that they pick their, you know, their, their sort of daily greens out of for salads and daily vegetables. Another year, it looked like this, with zinnias, marigolds, uh, leeks, and again, different salvias and, uh, and other herbs and so forth growing in among the brassicas. And another year, they had an entirely different combination of, uh, of annuals. So it's fun to, you know, if you have an area that, where you might normally just grow vegetables, you can do some really interesting, interesting designs, interesting things with a space like this. In this case, it's a permanent garden. That is to say, they have permanent lawn paths so the beds are established uh, as permanent beds uh, with lawn paths maintained in between. 
Okay, now we're going to begin to go through some of the, uh, the, the vegetable crops and varieties that really lend themselves beautifully to, uh, uh, to edible landscaping. And first I want to talk about salad greens. It's so easy to grow uh, salad greens. Uh, they're quick, they're easy. The spring crop, especially in Iowa, comes beautifully when it's cool in the spring. And I grow a combination of many colored lettuces. And in the center of this picture, you'll see auric, which is also called mountain spinach. It's a vegetable you might not be familiar with related to spinach. It's a European vegetable. But, they, but auric comes in three different colors, uh, wine red, chartreuse, almost yellow green, and then plain green. So it, uh, it can add quite a, uh, quite a colorful combination. There you see a big patch of the dark red auric right in the middle of the picture in between patches of different colored lettuces. So this is just kind of a geometric layout. Uh, instead of just planting your lettuce in rows, why not do something more interesting with these, with these lettuce varieties? Here's again a combination of different colors of lettuce, very uh, chartreuse, yellow-green ones, uh, dark, dark colored ones, leaf lettuces, romaine lettuces, and so forth. So utilizing the different leaf colors and textures. I often intermingle them sometime in a pattern like this. Um, two of the very beautiful romaine lettuces here. That red one is called, it's a fairly new variety, called outrageous <laughs> instead of outrageous. Very clever uh, little name there. Wonderful, wonderful dark red romaine. And two of my favorite varieties for color in the garden are uh, galactic which is that very, very dark, almost black uh, lettuce. Another variety that dark is called ibis. And then the other one is uh, Australian yellow leaf, but you can use the, the plain old uh, black-seeded Simpson, which is in every, on every seed rack uh, just as well. A very light green, delicious, productive leaf lettuce. And here's an example of incorporating lettuces together with red cabbage and some non-edible plants. Again, coleus is a nice uh, foliage plant to mingle in with vegetables. Um, but creating a, a colorful um, palette of, of textures and colors in what is strictly an annual garden. No perennials in this photo. This is just all annuals, but much more interesting than just a straight vegetable garden. Uh, cabbages also can be used in the garden effectively. That I think they're very attractive at any stage of their development. In this case, as you can see, I've planted my cabbages in with, um, in with zinnias. There are some very beautiful cabbages. This is a new variety called uh, colorsa. It's a, um, a pinkish, colorful savoy cabbage, a very nice one to grow. Um, of course, the red cabbages are especially colorful in the garden and terrific for winter storage, incidentally. These hard, small red heads last all winter long in a root cellar. And I particularly love the red cabbages in the fall because of the way they collect the, uh, the frost, the first frosts of autumn, um, that sort of dark reddish leaf really reveals the frost very nicely early in the morning. And of course there's nothing like opening one of those cabbages in the kitchen and you see that beautiful uh, series of, of uh, spirals, the, the classic golden mean spiral that uh, all living things are made up of. Another, uh, another beautiful spiral vegetable that I love to grow, a classic fractal uh, pattern in nature is this lovely uh, broccoli. Um, it's called Romanesco. It's a, a classic Italian heirloom variety that was brought over to America uh, for the first time, as far as I know, back in the uh, about the 1950s and has become quite popular among gourmet gardeners and, and, uh, and chefs just because it is such a beautiful thing. These lovely chartreuse heads uh, are just an incredibly beautiful. Unfortunately, Romanesco does not grow real well in hot climates. So this one is not really good for, um, for Iowa. It can be grown here, but it, uh, it doesn't do as well as, uh, as it did in coastal California where this picture was taken. 
But kales do very well here, and there are kales of many different textures and many different colors. I use kale a lot as a foliage plant in my flower gardens. In this case, this is just a, a production patch of, um, of various varieties in the vegetable garden itself. But I tend to incorporate them uh, all through the flower garden in a variety of ways. And again, my very favorite one is Lacinato. It's such an unusual uh, form, very dark green, and excellent eating in the, uh, in the late summer and fall, good keeper into the uh, early part of the cold season. And then on the right there, you'll see uh, fennel, bronze or purple fennel, which is uh, uh, also a very nice decorative garden. And, and you can, of course, use it as flavoring in your, in your cooking as well. One of the varieties on your plant list handout is red boar uh, kale which toward autumn turns this beautiful uh, sort of uh, pinkish purple color. And as the cold season comes on, it gets darker and darker. And uh, finally, the leaves are almost black with these deep purple veins. And when the frost hits that in the fall, it's just it's really worth a walk through the garden to see, uh, to see that plant. And it's a fairly tall kale. It grows about three feet tall, so it's a fairly good uh, presence in the garden by, uh, by autumn. The wonderful thing about kale in, in Iowa, of course, is that it keeps out in the garden for quite a while. And, and until the temperature drops uh, way down towards zero, we're still harvesting kale out from under the snow. Uh, so it's a, it's a good late season vegetable to have uh, to have in the garden for sure. And, and one of the most nutritious of all, of all vegetables, as a matter of fact. Um, this is a, a lovely combination of, of different brassicas and, uh, and other annuals like the lemon, lemon and tangerine uh, uh, marigolds, the tiny little marigolds. They're called citrus marigolds. And um, collards in the, in the center there of one kind or another. And then the the decorative kales, or, or uh, flowering kale, they're sometimes called in the foreground. And those, you know, people grow strictly for decoration. They're perfectly edible. Um, this is a, a picture of both flowering kale and flowering cabbage, so-called. Primarily, these varieties were developed in the Orient. They come to us mostly from Japan. But they're very, very beautiful to grow. In the, for the fall garden. And they can be incorporated in the flower garden quite beautifully. This is probably the one vegetable that you will most often see, as, in, as a matter of fact, in flower gardens. Uh, right here on the university campus, there were many plantings this fall of these, uh, of these wonderful plants. There's another one called peacock kale, which is one of the decorative varieties, also quite beautiful in the fall. Oopsie, here we go. <laughs> All right. Let's see if we see if it'll go the next time. And uh, let's try it again. Okay, I think we did it. <laughs> did we? Yep. 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 All right. <laughs> she's <laughs> I'm so glad she's here. <laughs> okay. I usually have to deal with those problems myself and I don't like to at all. Um, another group of plants which you're all familiar with, I'm sure, are the Swiss chards. And there are several varieties that are, that are worth talking about. The two that I'm going to mention by slides here, a couple others on your list. But the ruby chard or rhubarb chard, uh, various forms of it, some of them with green leaves and red stems. Some have totally uh, burgundy uh, colored leaves. Absolutely gorgeous foliage plant for the decorative garden. And um, you can incorporate, there's one of the very dark purple ruby chards planted in a totally red garden with um, uh, fibrous begonias and red and white uh, coleus there as a decorative plant in an annual uh, flower garden. So lots of fun combinations you can make with Swiss chard. 
But the one that is the most decorative for, for planting is a new release in the United States called Bright Lights. Comes to us originally from uh, uh, New Zealand uh, via this very uh, um, um, seed company in Australia that, I, that I've been working with. But Johnny's picked it up, uh, Johnny Select Seeds picked it up and got an all-American selection for it, even though it wasn't their development. But they claim they perfected it a little bit more. Bright Lights has lovely colors, beautiful, beautiful colors in the, uh, in the stems. It's just a fantastic, um, an absolutely fantastic plant to work with in the garden and in the kitchen. Imagine bringing that into the kitchen and working with it. I mean, it's just like, like cooking with, a, with a, a Rembrandt, you know. I mean, <laughs> fantastic stuff. I highly, highly recommend uh, Bright Lights chard. A perennial, which of course should be planted in your flower garden rather than your vegetable garden, in my opinion, is rhubarb. A very, very attractive uh, foliage plant, uh, beautiful in the spring when it first comes up, and, uh, and actually quite beautiful when it blooms as well. Uh, lovely big stalks of um, rather foul-smelling white flowers, but definitely a real presence in the garden. I mentioned uh, Italian radicchio a while ago. I don't know how many of you are familiar with radicchio. It's, it's not a, a well-known vegetable in this part of the country, but um, the two heads in the lower part of the picture are radicchio plants, which toward autumn make a very tight head like a red cabbage. And uh, I store those as well as the Chinese cabbages up above uh, by digging the plants taking off the outside leaves, so I have just the head of the cabbage and its roots, and I replant them in, in those plastic kitty litter trays in dirt in my root cellar, and I keep uh, both of these all the way through until April. Uh, it's one of the uh, great wintertime uh, root cellar crops I have at home, Chinese cabbage and, um, and radicchio for the winter. Another one which I store for winter in the root cellar by digging them and, and replanting them in, um, in containers are leeks. And my favorite of all for color is the Blue Soleil's leek, which is a French variety, an heirloom French variety that uh, turns a beautiful dark, uh, 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 I don't know what you call that, it's a, it's a dark waxy, waxy green with um, um, a purple blush as soon as the frost hits it. So it's a really beautiful decorative plant. You see it here growing with Sedum Autumn Joy. Very, very nice landscape plant. And again, if you're not uh, interested in har harvesting all the leeks for storage, they will keep out in the garden for quite a long while, and they're very beautiful when they're covered with snow. And don't forget another incredible perennial that uh, everyone's anxious to buy in the store in the spring, so easy to grow in your own yard. And that, of course, is asparagus. Doesn't look like much in the spring when they first come up because you're picking them all the time, but once you stop picking them and let them grow, uh, don't overlook the beautiful landscape potential of the, f of the feathery, uh, ferny fronds of the, of the um, asparagus plants. They get about six or eight feet tall. They would be a terrific backdrop behind a perennial garden or an annual garden. Um, so I heartily recommend the idea of putting a production patch of asparagus right up in your decorative garden instead of hiding it down in a vegetable garden somewhere. Another uh, very lovely landscape plant which is also edible would be a scarlet runner bean. This particular species of bean comes to us from, uh, from the highlands of Central America, Guatemala, um, Nicaragua, that part of the world. And um, um, of course they have these beautiful scarlet or scarlet and white blossoms, which are very, very decorative. And uh, you know, they, they can grow quite tall. Uh, you trellis them over some structure in the garden. Um, you know, this was a a porch in Australia, a very hot inland area of Australia, which the gardener shaded with, with trellises of runner beans in order to provide a shaded porch in the heat of summer. So you can do a lot of things with, uh, with runner beans. And of course, you can, 
You can eat the beans young in the pod, but I prefer to grow them all the way to maturity because this is what the various varieties look like. They're so beautiful and they're huge. These are way bigger than, than uh, regular beans. Make terrific uh, soup beans. In the perennial garden itself, there are things that you can grow which are edible, and, and especially I like to incorporate some of the decorative alliums, the decorative onions, and there are many different kinds that are available that you can plant. In the foreground here you see a purple one, and then right behind you see the um, um, garlic chives, which is allium tuberosum. It has uh, white flowers. Both of those are very nice in the perennial garden. Here's a close-up of garlic chives growing with, um, with cone flowers and, and, and other autumn flowers in the perennial border. And of course those decorative alliums make very good cut flowers as well. Now when it comes to peppers, I, when it comes to growing sweet peppers, which I do every year, instead of growing the standard bell peppers, which really only produce a small number of large fruits. I have found varieties through my experience at Seed Savers which are much more decorative than that, that are just laden with fruit. That, because they, they sit on the plant for quite a while and uh, in order to ripen them, so you might as well have something that you can really decorate your garden with. This is a Hungarian variety which is my standard uh, sweet pepper. It has a Hungarian name, Feher Ozon. Uh, you can get the seeds through Seed Savers and some other some other companies. Um, it's absolutely my favorite and enormously productive. Way more productive than bell peppers. Another real standard that's available everywhere are the sweet, sweet banana type peppers. They're very early prolific banana, sweet banana, they're various varieties. And again, they're very showy. They start out uh, yellow and then turn red, so they provide uh, a lot of attraction in the, uh, in the garden. Um, there are also various varieties of small, um, small bell peppers. There's a, a miniature variety that comes in red, in orange, and in brown. All three of those colors, so you can, you can grow all of them together and have a real mix of beautiful little bell peppers that are only about an inch and a half long. And there are many, many other sweet peppers that are quite productive, but the most beautiful decorative peppers are, um, are actually all pretty fiery hot. So if you like hot peppers, uh, you can get something to eat out of these. If you're, if you're not into hot food, well, I strongly recommend them just as decorative plants. This is a variety called Aurora, which goes from, uh, from yellow to orange to purple. No, I'm sorry, it goes from purple. Purple is the green color. And then to sort of yellow, orange, and finally to red. Another one called Christmas, which has uh, yellow and purple fruits when, when young and red when ripe. This is a new variety, I think an All-American Selection variety, fairly recent, called Chili, Chili Chili, I think it is, something like that. It's a, a very, very showy one, quite fancy. And these are all small peppers, you know, that only grow maybe a foot tall. I think one of the most beautiful ones for landscaping is one called variegata that has beautiful variegated foliage, uh, purple, white, green foliage. The, f the fruits go from dark purple to red. The fruits are not a large part of this plant. It's mostly the, uh, the foliage that you're after. And then on your list you'll see some varieties that have solid purple foliage which are very, very good, like Largo purple for instance, which uh, have leaves about this same size, but totally purple. Very nice landscape plants. There you see variegata pepper growing with uh, dark purple basil, like opal basil, cosmos, and, um, and um, the little coreopsis. I really like to do plant combinations with decorative peppers. Again, this is uh, a couple of kinds of decorative peppers with marigolds and purple uh, basil all growing together. Another one, this is a little washed out on the screen, but this is um, um, 
the decorative cabbages again and with um, the decorative peppers, a nice autumn combination. Another group of plants which I'm going to talk about now for a moment are maybe less familiar to you, at least less familiar to you as something to eat, and that would be the amaranths. Um, amaranth is a plant which comes to us from several parts of the world. There's about three species of amaranth involved uh, which, are, which have been eaten around the world either as vegetables or as grain. Um, all of you know this plant intimately, but by another name. Anybody ever hear of pigweed in Iowa? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, pigweed, actually there's a couple, three species of wild pigweeds in Iowa which are also edible. In fact, we could be talking a lot about edible weeds. If you want to get into that in the question period, uh, somebody asked me about edible weeds because probably a lot of these things you curse in your garden you ought to have in your salads, you know. But um, amaranths come in a variety of forms. Some of them are primarily decorative. They are all edible as a pot herb or as a spinach green when they're young. All of them. They're fabulous as a summer vegetable. But when they get to this stage, the leaves are too tough to really eat, and you're growing them mostly for the showy flowers and the, and the beautiful foliage. There are many, many varieties available. One of the common ones that I know some of you are familiar with is called Love Lies Bleeding, that very poetic, uh, rather gruesome name. Um, Love Lies Bleeding. You know, there's another wonderful plant that's not edible that's called Kiss Me Over the Garden Gate, and I think those should be planted side by side, you know. <laughs> they kind of both have a similar form, and it's just as in life, it's kind of hard to tell them apart, you know. <laughs> Uh, one called elephant head amaranth is very decorative, and incidentally, elephant head is a very good f flower to dry for uh, autumn and winter uh, decorations in the house. So that's a fun one to grow. It grows maybe about four feet tall. And the ones you're more familiar with are the really, really showy foliage uh, varieties. There's the one that Thomas Jefferson grew, the, the one in the foreground called Joseph Coat. And then the newer varieties that have been developed by the Japanese, there are several on your list under decorative amaranths, which are very, very showy. I mean, they are really amazing, amazing annual landscape plants. This is one of them out of Japan with incredibly colorful foliage. And here you see a, an annual border up at the uh, University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum with all mixture of animal, uh, animal, annual flowers mixed in together with the, um, with the amaranths. But I particularly like to grow the grain amaranths because I bake all my own bread and I very, very much enjoy incorporating grain amaranth uh, as a flower, as a ground flower in my, um, in my bread baking. These come to us primarily from uh, South America where, the, where amaranth was a sacred crop of the, um, of the Incas, um, uh, a staple crop, and in addition they made uh, religious icons out of the, uh, out of the amaranth paste. Um, but they grow quite tall, as you can see, often uh, eight, ten feet tall, and it's the flower head itself that is the primarily decorative part of this plant. And they come in quite a few different colors. And this would be the, the time of harvest at the end of the season. Uh, here uh, my son is working with the panicles that I have cut to thrash the grain out of. I, I just love growing these plants because they form such a presence in the back of the, uh, toward the back of an annual bed or even in the back of a perennial bed. Another combination of edible and non-edible plants with a dark purple-leafed amar amaranth up there in the, uh, in the upper part of that photograph as a backdrop for Swiss chard and then accents of roses and uh, the bright-colored coleus. So these are just some of the plant combinations you can play with uh, as you are growing edible plants as well. Another year up at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, they incorporated one of the tall 
amaranths in the back, a grain amaranth in the back behind the other annuals. And again, the contrast between the red flowers and the dark, dark purple amaranth was quite striking. Another area to explore uh, in edible gardening is, of course, herb gardening. Herb gardens can be very formal, as you see here. Um, you know, very, very uh, formal after the fashion of, of some of the European garden designs. This is all edible, you know, all edible flowers and edible herbs uh, forming that, um, that pattern. Uh, another rather formal herb garden might be something like this with, uh, with radial you know, kind of geometric patches of, of herbs. That would be thyme blooming on the right and golden oregano on the left. Uh, and other herbs in the background. So in other words, herb gardens by themselves can be very decorative. A scene from uh, Obrick, uh, Obrick Botanic Garden in Madison. Uh, they have a wonderful herb garden there with, uh, with beds in which they feature various herbs. In this case, there's a central uh, bed, all uh, different kinds of basils growing together. Here's another, another view of, uh, of that herb garden. Very attractive herb garden they have at that botanic garden. Uh, up at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, they have a, a, a little formal knot garden which they, in which they grow a variety of herbs uh, in the summer. And in the center, they bring out a potted um, a plant that we can't grow outdoors here, um, and that is the, uh, the European bay, bay leaf that you put in your cooking. That's, that's a... Um, uh, Loris nobilis, the European bay, in a pot, which you can grow in Iowa in containers, bring it indoors in the wintertime. Uh, but I tend to grow herbs more casually in my herb garden, sometimes all together, as you see here, a combination of, of herbs, chamomile and, um, um, what the, I don't know what that is, I think that's basil in the middle, and, um, and thyme in the foreground. And often, in an annual garden, I will incorporate my various colors of, of basil. I'm a great fan of basil and, uh, and dry a lot of it for winter and, of course, put up Italian pesto by the ton in the freezer. So uh, we use a lot of basil in my family. And um, for Thai cooking, of course, I grow the various Thai varieties, which are more uh, uh, licorice flavored. And here you see them uh, growing in with, um, with the edible uh, nasturtiums, the purple basil growing with the nasturtiums. But often I mix herbs together with, uh, with annuals as well. Here you have sage on the left, which is perennial, and basil and decorative peppers on the right. And in an annual garden, instead of again just having things separate, I often combine colors and textures. We have um, two different kinds of basil growing in, in with uh, marigolds there, giving a combination of texture and color in that mosaic. Sage itself comes in several decorative forms. Uh, besides the standard um, silver leaf variety, we have the purple, uh, purple leaf form. Um, we have this gorgeous uh, tricolor And we have one called Icterina, I think it is, which is yellow and green. So there's a variety of foliage plants. If you're going to grow sage, they all, they're all the same species. They all taste about the same. Why not you know, have, some, um, have some added color uh, in your garden as well? And there's nothing better than chives during the time of the year when they bloom in the garden. Another decorative allium that you can plant in your perennial garden or, or in an herb garden itself. Strawberries can be used decoratively, too, although uh, strawberry culture is complicated. Um, the one that I would recommend for landscaping purposes would be the, f the wonderful uh, French wild strawberry, which um, is available in nurseries, and, and it, it actually can, can make a pretty nice ground cover. And this is one you can grow in, in semi-shade. So for, for those of you who have shade gardens that uh, uh, need a little, 
uh, a little variety, I would, uh, I would try this strawberry. You can start these from seed, as a matter of fact. You can buy the seed of the French strawberry and, um, and grow them in, in quantity. And while we're on the subject of berries and, and fruit, there are many fruit-bearing plants which I think are worth considering in, in Iowa landscaping. Um, I've, I grow a lot of berries because this is the climate for berries. So I have, uh, in this case, uh, uh, cultivated black, black raspberries. I live on a couple hundred acres of land with lots of wild black caps, so I don't know why I'm growing, growing them in the garden, but they're bigger and easier to pick, you know. Uh, so I grow those on trellises, and by nature, that tends to be a linear proposition. So what I do with my trellises is I, I kind of uh, fence the garden or, or enclose the garden with trellised fruit crops like grapes and, uh, and berries rather than, than try to mix them in with the other plants because they require you know, their own structures. I mean, a, a grape trellis is kind of a, of a linear proposition, uh, although you can grow them, as you know, over pergolas and, and uh, arbors of one kind or another and over arches and doorways and on the sides of houses. So there's a variety of ways of incorporating uh, productive vining crops uh, in your garden. I am absolutely addicted to, to growing grapes because I came from the wine country in California where I had 45 kinds in my vineyard. And uh, it's been a bit of a come down in Iowa because none of those wonderful European vinifera grapes will, uh, will grow uh, here. So I have to lay a lot of my varieties down under leaves in the wintertime, which is a lot of work. But um, I grow too many non-winter hardy grapes, I'm afraid. But I can't resist because I love grapes. But Concord uh, grape, of course, is, uh, um, is the one that is probably the hardiest here. Various kinds of Concord varieties um, do quite well. And then um, an old dairy farmer up in northern Wisconsin named Elmer Swenson spent a lifetime breeding northern hardy grapes and has really opened up the whole northern tier of states and southern Canada to uh, primarily wine grape production through, through his varieties. This is a very, very good table grape. It has seeds, but it's an excellent variety called Swenson Red. And he's produced a whole bunch of varieties that, uh, that are excellent for winemaking. And tried to get some good seedless varieties. Hasn't done too well on that, but um, I grow several of his varieties. Another edible plant that's, that's hardy here are the winter hardy kiwis, which you see in the foreground here growing over an arbor. So the hardy kiwis are, are very productive. You have to have male and female vines, both. But um, if you do, you can get a prodigious amount of very, very nice fruit. Uh, don't even overlook the uh, prickly pear that we can grow here. This is the northern hardy um, uh, prickly pear cactus, and those fruits are edible as well. And these, uh, these grow quite well here in Iowa, believe it or not, in spite of our frigid winters. Um, a very, very lovely landscape shrub, clove currant or buffalo currant, blooms first thing in the spring and smells like cloves. It's absolutely the most heavenly aroma in the garden. And it has also small black edible currants. But just grow this plant. Uh, it's a wild plant native to the Dakotas. And on east of here, thrives here, and it's fantastic in the garden in the early spring. Um, and for those of you who have primarily deep shade, you can grow ferns, some of which have very nice edible fiddlenecks in the spring. This is ostrich fern in my shade garden, um, which in the very early spring produces edible fiddlenecks, which I like to steam up and, and eat kind of like asparagus. And here you see a harvest of uh, of the um, fiddlenecks, and that's uh, uh, wild leek or ramps, they're sometimes called, which I harvested out in my woods. I understand that the Indian name for, for ramps was uh, none other than Chicago. That's where the city got its name, as far as I understand. And last but not least, I want to mention the possibility of container gardening when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, to 
growing vegetables, don't overlook containers on the deck. And these are just, I'm just going to run quickly through some of the container vegetables which I've had uh, on my deck at home. Basil, different kinds of herbs, even tomatoes. All of these things can be grown in small spaces. Herbs like uh, rosemary on the left and lemon verbena on the right. Um, the lemon verbena goes in the root cellar in the winter and the rosemary goes in the house. So we have fresh rosemary year round. Oopsie. I hope we're not going to have trouble here again. Okay, we'll skip that one. Uh, lemongrass, another herb which can grow in containers very nicely, and I bring lemongrass indoors in the wintertime for my Thai cooking all winter long. More container vegetables, and in the background there you'll see a fig tree. Us Californians are stubborn. We can't move to Iowa without growing figs, you know. Um, and so I have figs in containers, and here you see me picking fresh figs uh, in, indoors in November as I'm ripening the autumn crop in the house, and then they all go in the root cellar for the winter. And, you know, it's, there's just nothing like fresh figs. We can't get them in Iowa, and, uh, well, you know, I just had to do that, that's all. <laughs> you know, gardeners are are maniacs, I'm sure you all realize that. And so we all have our areas of excess, you know. And of course the fig tree is beautiful in the autumn uh, color as well. And don't overlook growing citrus here. Citrus do very well in containers, dwarf citrus. Uh, I use a, a nursery called West Wind out in California which ships very nice um, uh, dwarf citrus trees. This is a Meyer lemon. Uh, this is a kumquat uh, on my deck, loaded with fruit. And the wonderful thing about the citrus, it comes in the wintertime, so uh, we're picking lots of citrus right now at home uh, off these dwarf trees. This is a calamondin, a wonderful little uh, tart citrus, which is fantastic for cooking. And there you see the close-ups of the fruit. And there you see the calamondin indoors in my window in the, um, in the wintertime. And the, um, the Meyer lemons come in as well. So I have Meyer lemon trees just hanging with fruit indoors right now at this time of the year. They don't have any leaves, you know, they, they don't like it in the, indoors in the winter. They lose their leaves, but they keep their fruit, so that works. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to just at the very last now mention uh, something about edible flowers. Um, as long as you're growing annual and perennial flowers, pick varieties that you can use in your, in your food. And you can see uh, several of them here. I'm not going to dwell on the list because uh, you can research the list uh, more completely. But certainly uh, uh, daylilies, pansies, roses, um, borage, Violets, these are a few of the, of the ones that you'll see in these pictures as we go along. And I just love harvesting the flowers and, and, and bringing them in. That in itself is a great pleasure. One of my favorites is Monarda, or bee balm. Very spicy, very aromatic. You'll see, that, uh, you'll see all of these in some, in some food pictures coming up. Borage, one of my favorites. Nasturtiums, and while at it, I grow Alaska nasturtium, which has variegated leaves, which are also edible, so why not have a beautiful foliage as well as a, an attractive flower? And don't forget tulips. The, the petals of tulips are quite delicious. Wonderful things you can do. Uh, Kathy Barish has some fantastic uh, recipes in her edible flower books for... Um, candied tulip blossoms and so forth. Really fun flowers to work with. So those are just a few. And squash blossoms, I just love eating squash blossoms. Uh, it's an Italian favorite. Uh, fried squash blossoms with, uh, you know, uh, coated in egg and fried in the pan in the morning for breakfast. Excellent. Um, usually pick the male blossoms, but if you're having trouble with an overpopulation of zucchini, <laughs> anybody ever heard of that problem? Um, any. Uh, just go out and pick the young female flowers and you'll, 
This is sort of a kind of birth con zucchini birth control, <laughs> you know. Uh, and you'll have a delicious vegetable uh, as well. So, but just the picking of those wonderful flowers in the morning and the smell of them is, is uh, very well worth, worth doing. And here is another, just another harvest of a variety of edible flowers from, uh, from my garden. Tuberous begonias also are edible. And roses, and I, I really love antique roses. I, uh, the the old-fashioned roses are the best, actually, for, um, for eating. Here's uh, the apothecary rose, dates back to the 1300s or even before. And a beautiful uh, bicolored one called Cameo. I have a, a nice sequence at home in my rose garden. Uh, I have an antique rose garden which is all daffodils in the spring. So I have an early round of, of color that looks like that. And then uh, when the roses are in bloom, there's, the heirlooms all kind of bloom at once, so I have this big bloom of roses. And then in between the rose bushes uh, and planted among the, among the daffodils are all the perennials, which come up later. So I've got a three-sequenced um, colorful garden uh, that way in my, in my rose garden. And here's a few things you can do with heirloom vegetables and, and edible flowers. Uh, why not make your food attractive and fun? Uh, this is just a salad made with a whole bunch of different colors of heirloom tomatoes. And they come in, you know, in many, many different colors. And so you see some of them there. Um, salads, you know, with grated beets, grated carrots, the beautiful Chiogia Italian beet, um, and uh, of course different lettuces and and the radicchio leaves around the outside. Very colorful uh, mandala sort of salad. So when, when we serve a table at home, often we have dishes with a variety of edible flowers in the salad, in the desserts, in the main dish as well. So it makes for a very colorful table. Another salad with different colored tomatoes chopped up and grated beets, grated white carrots, grated orange carrots. Uh, you can just use vegetables as, as, as color, you know, as, as a painter would the paints on a palette. This is the one that we made for Roger Swain one time when he visited us, and uh, Roger Swain loves to cook, so whenever Roger shows up, you know, the Victory Garden guy, why we always have to, we always have to get out, pull out all stops on the food. Borage in the middle there, and calendula petals. Calendula is a very good edible flower. You'll see those all through these dishes. More tomatoes and edible flowers in, in salads. Uh, stuffing tomatoes are really fun. This salad is all made of stuffing tomatoes with the lids on. You know, if you took the lids off, in, each tomato would be stuffed with a wonderful basil cottage cheese uh, stuffing. So they're really a lot of fun to... Uh, to use. Here's one with half the lids off so you can see the stuffing and then a little, a little uh, Johnny Jump Up on each one, which are quite edible. Basil leaves around the outside. You know, just fun things to do with food, playing with food, you know. Um, a flan dessert, a, a South American flan decorated with all edible uh, uh, flowers there, borage, uh, monarda, and rose petals primarily. A cheesecake. Uh, my black raspberries, just you know, sugared and plain, ready for, for dessert, decorated with flowers whose flavors go well with them, especially the monarda is wonderful with, uh, with fruit. Rose petals on the outside. So last, I just want to end by saying that um, you know, we do this for ourselves. We do it for, um, for the soul as well as for the stomach. Um, food is, is, is food for the soul as well. It might as well be beautiful. But we also garden, don't we, for the, for the next generation. I think that part of, of the legacy that we are here to perpetuate, this legacy of backyard gardeners and farmers that goes back thousands upon thousands of years, 
uh, it, it, it has to continue, and it continues through us, all of us in this room, uh, and, and what we pass on to, um, to our children. So when I go out and plant the seeds each spring, you know, I think of my own kids, and I think of, of, um, of, the, of the heirloom varieties whose genes I'm perpetuating by growing these wonderful old varieties, and I think of the next generation and how we're going to continue uh, this appreciation of gardening and of the natural world that, uh, that makes this planet such a beautiful place. Thank you very much. All right, I will read the question for David, and uh, we're going to begin with questions about pest control. We have all sorts of pests to control, <laughs> David. Um, do you have the knowledge? Do you have knowledge of deer-resistant plants or a method of planting to keep deer away? Um, oh, a really good rifle helps, but <laughs> um, well, I, I have two. Um, actually, no, I don't. The answer to the to the to the exact question about deer-resistant plants. Um, if you grow vegetables out in the open, you find that deer have their preferences. Uh, for instance, they left all my squash alone for a long time, and then one year, one doe uh, came along who just had this incredible hunger for squash, you know. <laughs> it was just one, but that's all it takes, you know, they're gone. So I built a big fence around the squash patch. So the answer to my deer problem has been fencing in part. In the production vegetable garden, I have a, a very tall deer-proof fence with rabbit-proof fencing around the bottom. And uh, within that, I also then have raccoon problems because raccoons uh, don't honor fences. They love fences, you know. That's just a, that's just a playground equipment to them, you know. So I have uh, electrified netting fence and a, a battery-operated fencer to deal with the raccoons. Um, I also have a dog. Um, but the dog actually makes friends with the animals much more than he... You know, when, when I saw several rabbits come out of my garage one day, followed by my dog <laughs> standing there, I realized that they were having a party while I was gone, so that's no help. Um, so the answer to, to my production garden is fencing. The flower garden is unfenced, and um, um, I, I tried arranging my, my trellises and my shrubbery in such a way that I fairly well enclosed my garden with a kind of a labyrinth because deer don't really like to feel trapped and enclosed. So the theory was that if they got inside all of this and felt like they were sort of trapped, they might not penetrate to the center. They might just sort of work the edges. And that was a great theory. Um, so now actually what I do is I tie my poor, uh, my poor dog who would really like to party with the animals, I tie him out in different sections of the garden at night in the spring when the deer problem is the most severe to keep him out of the roses and then off the grapes. And I move him around to keep the deer guessing. <laughs> but they've got it figured out because of course they know that he doesn't do anything, he just sleeps through it. So they just, if I put him here, they go there. If I put him here, they go there. And, um, uh, so I have, a, I have a bit of a problem, but in general, I, I deal with the deer and rabbit problem by planting uh, in excess. Uh, I just plant a lot and let them have some. Um, that's kind of how I deal with it. So I don't really, it isn't a major part of my concern. I, I work around it. And I live out in the country with, you know, I have 40 deer, you know, that live in my, right around my house. So it's not like I don't have a problem. Do you ever use a repel spray of any kind? I don't, no. And I, the, the question uh, asked was, uh, uh, if I do, do I know if that's safe on vegetables, vegetable, on edibles? I don't know the answer to that. I've never used a deer repellent. Um, I, I just don't worry about it, you know. I just let the deer have what they have, and, and I fence my, my big production from them. And, and most of my flower garden is not particularly is perennials and not particularly attractive to deer. The grapevines, which they love, I simply trellis high. I let them have the bottom row, you know, and I have the top row, so they can't reach that. So. Uh, what do, do you use a, a spray or anything for uh, insect pest control? How do you do that? Um, 
<laughs> this may sound very strange. I don't know if you've ever heard this particular answer to the question about, uh, about pest control. You know what the best pest control is? Manure. Healthy soil. Believe it or not. Um, insect pests tend to favor plants which are stressed. They just do. And so the first and foremost uh, uh, defense against insect uh, problems in the garden is to have a healthy soil and a healthy garden. That takes care of a lot of the problem. And then the second most important pest control is the power of your own observation. Every good gardener should walk through the garden and look at everything, even if it's just five minutes or ten minutes, you know, every, at least every other day. You know, this idea of, of going to the garden on a weekend, by that time, you know, the cabbage butterflies have laid their eggs, the caterpillars are half grown, and your broccolis are half gone, you know. Whereas if you had been out there every day noticing that the butterflies were laying their eggs, you'd be on top of it and you'd be able to do something about it in a timely fashion. So timing and observation are critical to insect control. And this is where my background as a naturalist has come in handy because I grew up an entomologist and I'm used to looking at the life cycles of insects. I understand, I pay attention to you know, what the insects are doing, when and how and where they're laying their eggs. And then you can come up with strategies interventions that are completely organic, often just physical. To give you an example, the squash vine borer is a big pest in Iowa. Well, there are three species of squash, and uh, uh, um, one of the species, which is the species to which butternut squash belongs, uh, is not susceptible to squash vine borer at all. So if I'm going to plant winter squash, I plant butternut, that takes care of half the problem. The summer squash uh, are susceptible, and, um, but you find out that the moth, if you pay attention, lays the eggs right down at the last inch above the ground. So you can just take an old nylon stocking or a piece of, uh, of, of uh, uh, curtain netting and drape over the base of the squash plant. That takes care of the problem. No insecticides, no poisons. Very simple. So if you just observe you know, the, the life cycle of each insect, You'll, you'll be fine. The only spray that I use for insect control is uh, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, for the cabbage butterfly caterpillars on brassicas. That's an introduced European pest that will steal you blind if your back is turned, and, and that's a completely organic, non-toxic um, spray, as long as these farmers with BT corn don't, uh, uh, don't wreck it for us all by creating uh, BT resistant insect pests, and that's a very serious possibility. Okay, what tomato variety were used to be, to be stuffed? Well, stuffed okay. your tomatoes? Um, there are a lot of um, uh, stuffing varieties available uh, in seed catalogs. Uh, there's a, there's a, a totally tomato seed catalog called Totally Tomatoes. And so uh, that, that's a good one to get your hands on because it offers a huge list of, of varieties, including a lot of heirlooms. But there's, there's stuffing tomatoes of, of several colors. There's red ones, there's yellow ones, there's brown ones, there's a green and yellow striped one called green bell pepper, there's a red and yellow striped one called striped cavern. They're all just beautiful varieties. And um, um, many of these are available in the more heirloom-oriented or specialty-oriented uh, tomato or vegetable catalogs. What makes a stuffing tomato a stuffing tomato? It's a, well, it's a hollow. Uh, the stuffing tomato uh, is, is, a, is a tomato with uh, three or four almost hollow cavities. The place where you usually have your seeds, actually there's just a very thin wall of flesh and then just an empty cavity, and in the center is a, is a little mound of... Uh, of seeds in each cavity, which you can just scoop out uh, by, with, with a spoon or your fingers, and then you end up with this uh, absolutely hollow tomato. And you can take, then you can take a spoon and scoop out the little center ridge where the seeds were, and you essentially have an empty tomato all ready to go. It grows that way. 
so that's, that's the advantage of them. And they're, they're quite fun to grow and beautiful and really fun to make salads out of. And are the plants different heights? Are, are, uh, they all, all the, the stuffing tomatoes I'm familiar with are indeterminate varieties. That means they continue to grow and they need to be staked or caged or trellised. Yeah, there aren't any uh, determinate dwarf uh, stuffing tomatoes that I know of. How do you keep asparagus bed, an asparagus bed weed-free? Oh, well, <clears throat> I wish that question hadn't come up. Um, but I think the answer is probably you don't, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know any successful way of doing it uh, other than a fair amount of work. But to answer this question along with uh, one or two others which we had about weed control uh, and mulching, my number one strategy for weed control in Iowa is mulch. Lots of mulch. And uh, I use leaves, and I'm very lucky to have Luther College nearby with all of their chipped leaves, which they, you know, suck up off the lawns and grind up. So I have, I haul 30 truckloads of, of packed chipped leaves every year for my garden. And um, um, I use a lot of leaves. And I just put leaves everywhere I possibly can. And on asparagus, I do that in the fall. And I weed the bed after I cut the, 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 the ferns down. Um, I go through one last time, and it's usually dandelions, which are pretty innocuous in an asparagus bed. They're not going to hurt your asparagus. But I try to keep them out of there. And I have worked very hard to make sure I don't have quack grass in the asparagus bed. I don't know. If you once get quack grass uh, in an asparagus bed or any perennial bed, uh, you just have to live with it. But keep in mind that quack grass does not like to be shaded. And so the ferns themselves will, will sort of canopy out, at least weaken. They never get rid of it, but they weaken the crack, quack grass during the summer. And that, uh, that helps. And also, either mowing or tilling around the bed continuously will reduce the, the encroaching perennial weeds. So but those are the strategies, mulching and a certain amount of digging and pulling and uh, and, and a lot of simply not caring. <laughs> Actually, if the truth were really known, uh, that's probably my greatest gardening advice. Just don't worry about it, you know. Uh, if you can't beat them, join them. If you can't weed them, eat them. <laughs> How many people work to keep your, to keep your gardens weed-free? Is it just you, or do you have a whole staff of people? <laughs> no, I don't have a whole staff. You know the old saying, me, myself, and I? Um, actually, it's not quite true. Um, I've, I've always had in my life, both here and in California, a kind of unofficial, I don't know if it's fair to call it an apprenticeship program or, or uh, whether it's actual slavery, I'm not sure. Uh, you have to ask the, the, uh, the people who come to live with me what their opinion is about that. But people come to work in the garden and actually, um, those of you who may be in, either in the field or, be, or, or might be aware of the field of, um, of gardening therapy, using gardening as a, as a therapy, very often people have come to live with us who, uh, who need that for one reason or another and um, come to help for the summer, live there at my house and, and, and help in the garden and, um, and are healed in the process. So there's sort of this unofficial um, um, program going on, you know. Uh, at the moment, I have a, a student, college student from Columbia, who's been living with me and going to school for three years now. And actually, I employ him. I, he's an employee, uh, part time, both in my office and photo business and in my um, gardening. So he does everything. He does the, you know, the gardening. He does the, he does my bookkeeping. He does, he runs my computer, which I'm completely inept at, and um, and enjoys the the gardening as well. So the answer really is I have one, usually one part-time helper in the summer, and I have a lot of strategies. I have like three acres of garden, which is a lot of garden, but. I've developed a lot of strategies to reduce the, uh, uh, the, the expenditure of time and energy. So mulching for weed control in annual beds, tilling of annual beds, which of course reduces the weed problem, the perennial weed problem especially. The mulching controls the annual weeds. Um, and more recently, I've gone to permanent clover and lawn paths in the 
uh, in the production garden, which are, which are just permanent, or they're rotational. So I'll have a, this, this clover path will be a path this year, but since it's clover, that's a cover crop. I plow that under, that becomes a bed. I plant this bed into a path. So I sometimes rotate and therefore do green manuring you know, uh, of, my, of my beds that way. Um, and that strategy reduces the weed problem also uh, considerably. Um, and otherwise, I think that's about it for weed control. That pretty well covers could, weed control. Could you repeat the name of the small bell peppers? Um, mi miniature, miniature bell. Uh, is, is a name that they're often sold under. And they're, hard, they're a little hard to find. Seed Savers catalog carries them. Um, the Totally Tomatoes catalog, which isn't just Totally Tomatoes, it's also Totally Peppers, but they have, they have them as well. I think all three colors, those two catalogs I know carry them. And they're very nice, they're very productive, hugely productive. Each plant bears, I don't know, a couple, three dozen fruit, so. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Do you have any rhyme or reason for your interplanting, or do you just go for color combinations? Do you follow any companion planting rules while you put plant by plant? That's a good question. The answer really is, is no. Uh, I have no rhyme or reason to anything I do in this world, frankly. Um, <laughs> I'm a pretty random guy. Uh, uh, I, I've, read, you know, I've read some about companion planting. Um, I'm not terribly convinced about it. Um, I, I don't mean to say that it doesn't work because I'm not knowledgeable about it, frankly. Um, my plant combinations really have more, much more to do with aesthetic, but they also have to reflect the way the plants grow and the spacing they require. There were some other questions here which I'll anticipate about the spacing of plants and, and, and how I arrive at that and whether the, the close spacing creates disease problems. That's an excellent question. Uh, plant disease is a huge, huge problem uh, in this climate, and uh, air movement is critical. But um, so, yeah, uh, there are some plants that don't do well with tight spacing. A good example is bush beans, for instance, which are very susceptible to mold, to fungi, fungal infections. I wouldn't try to interplant those tightly. I grow those in, in, in rows with a lot of air space in between. Uh, so I tend to grow plants in the, in, the, um, um, in the intermixed garden that don't have disease problems particularly due to, that, due to spacing. So I just give them the space that I know they're going to need, and I just know that by experience. Uh, every plant has its sort of maximum radius, and you need to know what that is uh, when, you, when, you, when you plant them in any, in any form. Uh, so that, that's an important consideration. Uh, but no, I, I, don't pl I haven't arranged my garden according to companion planting rules of any kind. Um, but I would also add to that, however, that diversity is a really important, is a, is a really important um, um, biological, ecological principle that applies to gardening as well. And so I'm just of the belief that if you have an intermixed garden uh, instead of a monoculture, it's going to be a lot harder for any insect pest to sort of build up in any number because you're not creating this, this big block, this big monoculture block uh, that, that uh, the insects can proliferate in. And I think that just intermixing the, all of the different plants together actually probably tends to reduce the insect infestations to some extent. That's, that's a guess. I, I don't know that for a fact. Um, and then, of course, the other reason I grow a very diverse garden, I, I, I grow and save seed from probably two or 300 varieties of annual vegetables and flowers every year, given the whole deal. And um, that's quite a lot. But the reason I do that is because every year is good for something and bad for something else isn't it? I mean, we had this horrible cold summer this last year. I mean, I could have grown peas and broccoli and stuff, <laughs> you know, and, and I did. And other things, tomatoes, we barely got tomatoes in time for frost, you know. So you never know. And so I always grow, 
I not only grow a diversity of crops, but I also grow a two-year supply of things that I'm, at least a two-year supply of things that I'm stocking up on. Like, uh, uh, I always keep a couple, three years of tomatoes canned, you know, and, and, uh, and other things that I, that I am growing, herbs, for instance. Basil, I'm always ahead on dried basil and so forth. So when people look at the scale of what I'm growing, they forget that I grow virtually all my produce, fruits and vegetables. I, I, I buy very, very little in the store of any of that. And um, um, when it comes down to, to growing herbs like poppy seed, for instance, that takes a whole plot, you know, that most people don't grow. Uh, never mind that it's the opium poppy. We won't talk about that. <laughs> but um, um, so I grow things that most people don't grow. So I grow a larger garden than, than most people do. How do you dry your basil? Uh, good question. I have a great system for basil. Basil is one of the few things I can air dry in humid Iowa. Maybe we're not quite as humid in Decorah as you are here, but I pick my basil during a, I watch the weather. I watch for a, a, a low humidity, sunny spell coming up. And I pick the basil and I dry it on big window screens. And um, so, you know, propped up so it gets air on both sides. Best to dry it not in the sun because hot sun burns it and vaporizes all the volatile oils and flavors. So dry it in the shade. And um, if it turns humid, I move those drying racks into the basement and um, just put them indoors where they're out of the humidity. And I keep a, a low humidity basement, so um, the ground floor of my house. And so I move them in and out until they're reasonably dry. And then um, I have a great big wheelbarrow, nice and clean, hopefully, and a big window screen, which I put over it. And when I'm ready to process the dry basil, I put the, the dried leaves out on the window screen in the sun for just a little while to crisp them up really good on a nice, low humidity, sunny day. And then I just rub them through the window screen. And I do all my herbs that way. And that's the perfect texture. It just comes out just, just nice, tiny little flakes, just like you'd buy in Spice Island jars, you know. And I, do, I can do a two-year supply in 10 minutes, you know, just like that. Very easy. I have read that some fiddleheads from ferns are carcinogenic. What do you know about this? Well, not enough. The, the answer to that is a very good question, uh, and it goes back to my comment about edible wild plants and edible flowers. Um, these are important questions to answer. Um, and I have not researched the, the whole gamut of fern fiddleheads. I know that this is true. And so what I've done so far is I've eaten the, I've eaten the ostrich fern, which in, according to my reading is one which uh, picked at the early stages of spring uh, is okay to eat. Now how okay, you know, I mean, can you eat them every day? Um, not sure the answer to that. Obviously, you know, I'm alive, I ate that plate full and I'm here to tell the <laughs> tale. So there, at least I haven't gotten cancer yet, but um, I think that the ostrich fern is a, is a safe bed at that stage. But that is a good question, and I would research it if I were you, if you plan to eat very many of the fern varieties or fern fiddlenecks. Because some are, some are pretty, some are way toxic, some of the species. Are heirloom varieties more disease resistant? Very good question. Um, and not one that's, that, can, that can be answered with yes or no. Uh, some are, some aren't. Uh, one of the miracles of modern plant breeding, in fact, ha let's take tomatoes as a prime example, but there are other crops as well, has been to deliberately breed in, um, and we're not talking GMOs here, we're talking conventional plant breeding, uh, specific disease resistance to a wide variety of, of diseases for that plant type. And uh, so, for instance, if you live in an area, as we do here in Iowa, where tomatoes are susceptible to certain diseases, then you're probably better off if you go and get one of these VFN resistant, whatever, you know, hybrid tomato varieties. Um, some of the heirlooms are less resistant to some of these diseases. On the other hand, um, it's, it can equally be said that many of the heirloom vegetables are more resistant to plant diseases. They've been around for thousands of years. Uh, there's been a lot of selection through thousands of years of backyard gardening, gardening 
to a wide variety of diseases. And in fact, where do you think plant breeders go to get the genes for disease resistance? They go to the old varieties. That's exactly where they go. That's what saved the American corn crop during the corn blight back in the 70s. We, would, we wouldn't have corn in Iowa if it w weren't for you know, the genetic preservation of heirloom varieties. So that's, that's the mixed answer. <laughs> How do you control slugs? Control what? Slugs. Do you have slugs? Slugs? Oh, slugs. <laughs> Jeez. You slug them. Um, well, I don't. Uh, I come from California where snails and slugs are way bigger a problem than Iowa. So here, you know, 10,000 slugs a night in the garden is nothing. You know, I don't pay attention to them. There are certain plants that they eat. They love to riddle the hostas, for instance. They really don't bother my vegetable garden at all. They're not a pest in my garden to a proportion of, uh, that necessitates um, an answer. Uh, you, I have put out beer, you know, but God, what a waste of good beer. You know, I, just, <laughs> it just, I just can't do it. I've tried it, you know, but... So the answer is I really don't have a problem. How do you process your, amaranthus, your amaranth seeds for flour and making bread? Amaranth is a really, really wonderful grain crop, a little recognized and understood in America. Um, it's the easiest grain to, to process at home. Almost all of the other grains, and there was another question incidentally about other grains to grow in Iowa. Um, you can grow a variety of grains, but the, the, the limiting factor is how you harvest and, and, and have to thrash them and clean them and all that stuff because many of the grains come with a husk and it's very hard at home to, you know, to deal with that. So um, amaranth is the easiest because the seeds fall out of these, uh, these giant panicles free and clear with no other uh, major problem. But here's how I do it. I pick them green, not dry, uh, at the end of the season, at the time you, when, when the seeds are just beginning to shatter out and you can go and tap them or rub them a little bit and if all these little tiny pinhead sized size seeds start falling out in your hand, you're probably close to uh, ready to harvest. And, um, uh, and I cut them, the panicles, cut the whole thing up, put, a, put them in a wheelbarrow, carry them up to the garage or someplace and, and pile them on a big huge bed sheet. And when I get the whole crop harvested, I've got a mountain about this high, and I sit there, and this is the time-consuming part. I haven't figured out a better way. I actually thrash them by hand, and I take each one and just rub it and bang it, rub it and bang it, throw it aside. It takes me about a half a day to go through that pile, and it's about a two-year supply. I grow amaranth every other year. So it's not exorbitant. It's a fun project, and I take I do it in stages until that's done. And then I take all that seed and chaff that comes from that process and I put it out in the sun on these bed sheets uh, to dry. Spread it out and let it dry thoroughly. And the seeds shrink down a little bit and all the chaff dries. And then I run that through my famous same window screen. I've got this wonderful window screen mentality, you know. I screen it all into that wheelbarrow a bit at a time and I have a blower, and you could use a hair dryer. I have an old vacuum cleaner motor, actually, which I plug in and I, I blow the chaff out because what comes through the screen are the seeds and these little papery caps. And once you blow all that paper out of there, you have nothing but pure seed. And that whole process, I can do the two-year supply in about less than a half an hour, probably. That's how I do it. And then I grind it. I have a grinder, and I grind uh, when I grind wheat berries and corn and other things for my bread. I grind the amaranth as well, and I use it about one quarter uh, in to other flours in the bread. What does second it, only to soybean, incidentally, in protein. Very high in protein. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What what do the fuzzy tomatoes look like? What does the fruit look like? What size is it? And how about the flavor? Well, the, they're they're. Uh, average in flavor, I you know it's not wouldn't be my number one production tomato, um, but most of the fuzzy varieties I know, like Angora or Fuzzy Wuzzy, uh, are have fruits about this big, like a you know small, uh, like a large cherry tomato or or small salad tomato, and you know good flavor, um, perfectly fine tomato. Uh, what's nice about them is that they're, they're determinate and uh, 
um, grow nicely, small stature in the garden. So they'd be good production tomatoes if you had a small yard. Okay. Uh, do you have a greenhouse where you keep your plants in the winter, or uh, do you just bring them all in the, in the house? Um, I don't have a greenhouse. Um, a greenhouse is fairly costly, and uh, I mean, I'd love to have a greenhouse. Uh, you know, it'd be a great luxury, but I don't need one. What I have instead are huge cold frames, big ones. I've got three quarters of the length of this room in cold frame. And I designed a cold frame so that you don't have to lift the glasses up. They slide on tracks this way so that you don't have windows blowing down and breaking. And I use tempered glass so it won't break. I've got super cool cold frames that I designed myself. And um, uh, I start most of my plants in those cold frames in the spring. And I, I do very, very little direct seeding in the garden except for root crops. Um, like carrots and beets and so forth. But anything that can be transplanted, I, I plant in, in flats and separate out again into more flats or, I, uh, or into four inch pots or I plant in these cells, you know, these various kinds of cells that, like lettuce that I can just lift out and, and put. And even squash, I don't direct seed anymore because of the uh, cucumber beetle problems on the seedlings. I grow my squash in the cold frame in, um, in uh, one gallon containers and then when the plants are pretty big I set the whole thing out you know uh, without disturbing the roots out of the pot and into the soil uh, so I do a lot of transplanting that way and I found that extremely helpful uh, to avoid insect problems kiwi vines how do how to produce fruit male just, and female? You, just you bet you have to when you buy kiwi uh, make sure that you buy a male and a female um, vine. That's really all there is to it. Pretty simple, you know. Birds and the bees. Got to get them, to put them together, and, and you'll get them. You'll get fruit. Are all roses edible? As far as I know, they are. It's one of the cases where you want to taste test your way through your rose garden because some are more tender than others, and some are more tough than others. Um, and so, and I particularly mentioned the heirlooms as the best. These old-fashioned roses that have very uh, aromatic but thin, delicate petals are better than big tea roses and, so, and, 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 and those more modern roses. So I think the old-fashioned roses are the better ones. Uh, while we're on that topic of, of, of uh, flavor, another question relative, related to this was um, to describe flower flavors. There's a huge array of flavors. Some are very subtle and some are very strong. The members of the mint family like Monarda or, um, or the cat mints like uh, Nepeta Siberica, for instance, which is a good edible flower, they have a very strong flavor, strong, minty, spicy, almost hot flavor. Uh, whereas borage, I don't even know if I could, could taste a borage flower. Pansies are very mild. Uh, some like tuberous begonias and, and uh, um, tulips are very sweet. So there's, there's quite a, a range, actually. Most are reasonably neutral except for the minty ones, I would say. So are we, uh, um, am I correct in thinking that you do not use any pesticides, herbicides? Other yeah, than? that's correct. I don't do any, um, any I am very, very opposed to uh, the, the, the poisoning of our environment. I mean, I'm extremely um, opposed to that approach to horticulture and uh, particularly to commercial agriculture. We're, we are really seriously damaging the planet through these practices and we, we have to urge our farmers to, you know, to join the Practical Farmers of Iowa and, uh, and other organizations devoted to developing organic commodities agriculture. We need to, we need to patronize our, our organic uh, grocery counters and co-ops and uh, and just boycott commercial agriculture, in my opinion. I think that would be, uh, that would be something that all of you could do easily, um, and uh, it would make a big difference in the world. It really would. And certainly in your own gardens. I'm convinced that the vast majority of, of things that people spray for in their gardens uh, can be avoided through diligent observation and practical interventions at the right time. Uh, that are of a mechanical, mostly mechanical nature. And also, th just don't panic. I mean, so you have a little bit of, of fungus on something. I mean, it, so what? You know, it's, 
um, it's not that big a problem. A few holes in a, in a vegetable leaf isn't going to kill you, you know. So a lot of it is just learning to live with these systems and let them be a part of our life and not, not do battle with them all the time. At least certainly you can do that in a home garden. I'm going to ask one more question, with, and we have several questions that were not answered, with the idea that if, if, if you want to stay, you'll be able to stay a little mm -hmm. while after. If mm -hmm. people would like to come up and talk with you, if I haven't answered your, asked mm -hmm. your question, then perhaps you could talk with David personally. Uh, if, for those of us who grow rhubarb, should you cut the flowering stem back if you're going to continue to harvest the rhubarb in order to make it better? Yeah, I would, um, in, first of all, they look, as soon as the flowers are done, the, the stalks begin to look really unkempt. Plus, I think rhubarb can become a bit of a pest. The seeds germinate readily, so you can start having rhubarb seedlings around your garden, and heaven only knows we don't need more rhubarb, you know. <laughs> uh, so I cut them, as soon as they're done blooming, I cut them back. Uh, at that point, the rhubarb plant begins to decline for the summer anyway, but it is true that if you cut the flowers off, especially, you will get some secondary leaves and you can pick rhubarb on into the summer. And then there will tend to be another flush of growth later in the summer that you can use as well. So you can, you can harvest rhubarb off and on through the summer. Definitely, I would say, cut the, the stalks off for sure. Okay. Thank you so much, David. This You're has welcome. just been great.